Hi there, everybody. So we'll get started here. I'm Carrie Clark. I'm your co-host and moderator, along with Sharon Watkins, who owns Shay Z. <laughs> and thank you, Sharon, for allowing us this space. And uh, I'm a real estate agent by day here in Austin. That's my day job, but this is kind of my passion project. Um, getting to visit with interesting people in this fun, relaxed setting here at Shay Z. Uh, um, of course, tonight we have Gay Gaddis, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard about and know by reputation. And I had for many years, but I had no idea really what a kick ass woman she was until I read this book. <laughs> so, Gay is uh, the CEO and founder of T3, which I always wondered what that meant. And it means it's the T's in the think tank. Um, she creates the T3 and her company creates digital marketing programs for Fortune 200 clients and it was started here in Austin but she now has offices nationwide. She sits in the Dean's Advisory Council with UT School of Business. She's a former chairman of the Texas Business Leadership I'm Council. Still, still oh, you're here. still there? Oh, okay. <laughs> but you're the former chair, but you're still there? No, you, I'm you're still the, chair. the chair. Oh, okay. And you, are you still the chair of the Committee of 200 or no, former? I'm, okay. I'm former. <laughs> okay. She's received numerous awards, including uh, Fast Company's Top 25 Women Business Builders, Inc. Magazine's Top 10 Entrepreneurs of the Year, C200's Luminary Award, and of course, she is the author of this fabulous book, which you can purchase back there. Uh, Gay brought some books for us, and then Gay can auto will be autographing these after we finish up. Um, so why don't you go ahead and just start by telling us why you wrote this book? To be honest, I felt like I was old enough. You know, I um, started the company in 1989, and I've done a lot of work um, with helping women around the world to progress their careers and to really learn more about how to become as successful as they can be. And so I thought, I've got some knowledge to share here, and I wanted to do that. But there was another reason to write the book. Um, the reason it's cowgirl power is twofold. One reason is that I'm an old Texas cowgirl myself. Uh, I actually have on a belt buckle, y'all have to see, that's got a scorpion in it. Isn't that great? Um, it's crazy. But <laughs> um, um, I started riding horses when I was about four years old. And by the time I was five and six, I was literally working cattle with my godfather in the rice fields in, uh, outside of Liberty, Texas, which is a small town where I grew up. And so I've been around horses and on ranches and learned from people my whole life about those values and I wanted to instill that because that's how I've run my company. The other thing that happened though is that I decided to go to the Cowgirl Museum in Fort Worth. How many people have ever been there? If you've been there I'm sure you'll attest it is absolutely a fabulous facility and uh, some people when I talk about the Cowgirl Museum think of tumbleweeds and hay bales and barn rails but no no this is a first class beautiful museum and I started researching these women who had lived in the late 1800s and competed and won against men in international rodeos and competitions all over the world. And they were really our first international female superstars in the United States. Most people have heard of Annie Oakley. A lot of people have heard of Sonora Carver. But there were a whole list of women that were truly exceptional and, and showed courage and grit and showmanship and determination that were, was a bit unusual for that era. And so I wanted to put them in the book because, as I've told a lot of people around the country when I talk about it, uh, the movie Hidden Figures came out this, a year ago. And, and when that movie came out, all of a sudden our eyes were opened that there were some women that were doing some pretty amazing things at NASA that we didn't even know about. And so that's a little bit about why I put a snippet of some of these cowgirls in front of each chapter because I didn't want them to be forgotten. And I wanted people to know how extraordinary they were in their time. And I have to end that by saying that in the 1930s, the men decided that they weren't going to compete with these women anymore because they said, too many women are getting hurt. 
but that's not the reason. I mean, the women didn't care. They did get hurt and some died, but the men just decided they weren't going to compete with them anymore, and that was the end of an era. So I wanted these women to be spotlighted in the book as just kind of a beacon of, wow, look what they did, and hope to all of us. Well, and you tie it in nicely, you know, kind of your antidotes about business with, with these cowgirls. But let's talk about, you do talk, you, you talk about the cowgirl girl power, and then you also talk about personal power. And can you tell us how you feel it's different than our traditional understanding of power? Power, the word power is used a lot. And it usually, in my mind, and I think in the minds of a lot of people, has a top-down connotation where I'm in charge, I'm in power, I gain power, and therefore I'm in charge of you and I tell you what to do. And it's that kind of command and control kind of power. What I try to reveal in the book is the power that lives within all of us. And it's weird sometimes and interesting and fascinating to me as I wrote the book, the times that I realized that I had that power coming through. And it wouldn't have been at a time where I got a promotion necessarily, or I got that account, or I did something. It was a little victory that I had inside, and all of a sudden I gained confidence. So I also talk about, though, a model, and I say it's not easy. There's not an easy path to this. To become really good at something, you have to work hard, and there's no way around it, and no one can give that to you. Anyone can learn anything about anything these days and be an expert. So I recommend in the book that if you want to learn about something or if you really want to be good at something, you put in the hard work and you get good at that. And because of that, then you can gain confidence because you are competent at something and you're truly competent, you earn the confidence. And then the end game of all that is if you're in a meeting or if you're presiding over something, you can be assertive, and I don't mean in a cruel or jackass way or whatever jerk way. It's not being assertive to be, you know, I know it all. It's more assertive because you know, and you've done the hard work, and that's what I'm really trying to share with people is that's how you gain your personal power. And it will come back to you many different ways, but that's my view of the path to that. And by the way, I feel it? like Kathy mm -hmm. Lee how that here. <laughs> and you feel like these cowgirls, they had their own personal power, and you like some of the words used to describe them. Um, and so you also talk about that we need personal power because it increases our options. Talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the terrifying things to me, and when I look around at people all over the world, is when you don't have options. And sometimes we are forced in situations un, you know, just where you are or what's happening to you, where your options are shut down. And so my thought is, you know, the more you have, if you have the freedom to do it, uh, and you can, and even in situations where you're oppressed, if you can gain your personal power, it opens doors, it opens options for you. And that's the happiest thing you can have. Uh, if you only have one path to something or one way out, that's not always good. So gaining your personal power, understanding that will open doors to people or open their minds to things that they are able then to go and really push through. So options are good. And uh, when you have no options left, it's, it's kind of a scary world. One of the things I just thought was absolutely fascinating is your, you have been a student of personality types pretty much your whole life. So I would like for you to tell us about that and how you learned about them and which systems you've studied. Okay. Um, my first job was a failure uh, and I had been very successful at the University of Texas. I have an art degree um, and I, was, I learned how to be an art director though in an advertising agency. That was a, some, a skill I learned so I could parlay that into a job. And so my first job I thought was perfect. You know, I was working at the Richards Group in Dallas, but something wasn't working. And I couldn't figure out why the creative muses had left my shoulders and why I was just really kind of became a failure. And I got fired. I was ready to leave anyway. It was so horrible, but I was fired from my first job. So I went off to another job and I was at Baylor Medical Center in Dallas. 
and started off in the media relations group and then before I knew it at a very young age it, it's kind of an interesting set of circumstances that I can tell you about later but um, I ended up becoming the director of public relations and I was the ripe old age of 22 and it was very a very tough job for a person my age but I had a great mentor and uh, he was head of the foundation that had run the hospital system for a while Boone Powell senior so I learned how all of a sudden in that situation that I did well and I was around people and I was doing things well but it took my third job before I really figured out why and that is I was working in Atlanta Georgia for a management consulting firm and they were very big on the DISC profile the DISC and the Myers-Briggs and so we would use those tests if we were helping teams co coalesce or teams become more effective and and teaching leadership skills and uh, I just was riding on the coattails of four guys who gotten their MBAs at Harvard together and learned so much from them went back to school and to business school to, to begin to work on an MBA but the best thing I learned from them was what my type was because all of a sudden the light bulb went on and I thought that's why I failed at the first job I was in an introverted environment and I am an extrovert. I was in a situation that was much more critical thinking and linear thinking. I'm a big picture person. So because of that and, and because I started really studying the Myers-Briggs, it's a lot of what I've used in T3, at T3 really to help people build teams. And I tell everyone that you have to be very aware of your weaknesses and your strengths. And I know mine really well. So the secret to any success I've ever had was doing what I do well, leaving the failures, leaving the weaknesses over here, and finding people to shore up those. And when I find people who shore up my weaknesses, that's when I shine, and they shine, because it's an opportunity for them to do things that I don't do well, and we kind of coalesce and make the teams work. But I'm, I'm a real big believer in understanding that about yourself, and it's not the end all be all. I'm not saying that no, that's the answer to everything, but certainly understanding those fundamental strengths and weaknesses can help you in any career or any even a marriage or any, any situation you're in. Well, it seems like to me you were one of the, you know, you used that principle to, to build teams and to build your company mm -hmm. because you really understood it. Have you studied like strength finders and the Enneagram and other personality? I'm, I'm aware, aware of them mm -hmm. and I've seen, seen other, other people, people use them, but I've had to kind of stick to my guns mm -hmm. there. And, uh, and for me, Myers-Briggs has been the most useful. Uh, I, I think there's others that are just, you know, very good, but just for me personally. And I, I still think the DIS test is good. And they, they've changed it some and they've changed mm -hmm. all of them. They have to mature along with uh, the... Yeah, well, but I, just figuring that out in your 20s, I didn't figure it out until my late 40s or 50s, understanding personality types. And it, like, changed my life. It's amazing. Um, and I tell a lot of young yeah, people, the faster you can figure it out, the better. And I just fell into it, basically. I, I don't know that I would have done that on my own, you know, to go out and try to do all that. But um, it was something that just came to me uh, because of the job I was in and changed the way I started thinking about things. But it's really clear to me throughout your career you're not you're a person who absorbs information but then you also apply it which is why you continue to be successful so do you all want to know what I am on the Myers-Briggs does sure. anybody know I'm an ENTP and so I'm an extrovert I'm an uh, intuitive thinker and so that's where the application comes in because um, and I'm not an S and STs can do that but and then the P part is a possibilities and that's probably or that bigger, you know, kind of what is, what's next, what's next, and I see the big world out there. Um, and that's a lot of the reason why I love, <laughs> I talk about a book, I want you to have options, because the P loves options. And uh, maybe that's not as important to other people, but it's a big thing, so that's, so I, yes, I, I'm an intuitive thinker, and so I, that's where the logic stuff comes in. I go, we gotta apply this stuff. Um, you also talk a lot about, and again, tying it into the cowgirls, about being authentic, being able to see oneself objectively. Can you talk about that as well? Yeah. Uh, one of the things about these cowgirls that I realized after researching them and really um, doing some deep dives into their careers and what they were like, they were extremely supportive of each other. They traveled in um, you know, a very male-dominated world. 
and um, they helped raise each other's children. They married brothers. They became a real network and support system for each other. And somehow along the way, life ch changes and goes up and down. And I can recall uh, in my early career that women were not very supportive of each other. And I think it, the reason was because each person who was trying to succeed was so busy trying to claw their own way into a place and become successful that you didn't really have time uh, or you didn't really want to help anybody else because you were just determined to get to your own place. And I understand that. I mean, I, I laugh and say that I have scars on the top of my hands. As I was crawling up a ladder, there was stiletto heels going the whole way up. Uh, and, but now I'm seeing a bit of a difference. Um, I'm watching as I've traveled around and talked to a lot of people that women are being much more supportive of each other. And for the brave men who are in the room tonight, this book is not really just for women, but you have to have a target market in a book. And so, yeah, it's got a lot of stuff for women, but uh, it's, it's also an entrepreneur story. It's also a story about how, you know, I have found certain things that are successful in business. So. And you also talk about seeing oneself objectively. You really are big on getting feedback and getting people to kind of be on your team to give you feedback. Um, I want to say something about that. Okay. Um, it's, it's very difficult right now in the political environment that we're in and the time that we're in sometimes to give people the honest feedback that they need because it can come across as harassment or, insens or insensitive or not engaging or in some way. And I think especially for men to be able to critique women is a little tougher than it used to be uh, because what if that's con contrived or, or, or perceived in a way that is inappropriate for some reason. Um, so I worry a little bit about that because one thing that I talk about in the book is that cowgirls can take criticism and here's why. You know, if you're not tying a slip knot right, you can hurt the horse in yourself. If you're not doing certain things right, people had to tell you, no, that's wrong, that's not the right way to do it. And so we are a little hesitant, I think, sometimes in our corporations and our companies to give the honest feedback that a person needs to develop to the biggest person and, and, and the best that they can be. And so I worry about that a little bit. I want to make sure that we are still willing to give constructive feedback to people so that they can really get better. And you also talk about women being responsible for themselves. I know you've been in a jillion, you know, meetings of why aren't there more women succeeding and you have a strong, you feel, per, have strong opinion about that. Share that with us. I do. Um, there is a lot going on, and I'm involved in some of these movements and things. Where yes, paradigm for parity. Let's get more women in the work room, you know, the boardroom. More women here, more women there, and that's good. And we need to help each other. But I don't want anyone to sit around and wait all day for quota systems or for someone to do this for them. You have to take control of your own situation right now. And if we wait for the world to bestow upon us, you know, the things that we think are fair, we may wait a long time. And I just feel like take charge of yourself. And so this is, you know, this book was pretty out there in a lot of ways because uh, there are a lot of women's books that are kind of wringing hands and whining about, you know, well, why didn't they do this? Or somebody else needs to do that. Or they need to buck up or they need to do this. And I'm saying you buck up yourself. And, you know, at least you feel that you've done everything you could to advance your career, advance whatever you're trying to accomplish. And the good things seem to come along if you do that. Um, but things aren't always fair. And, and I don't want anyone to wait around for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're definitely kind of a take charge and let's let's get going giddy up kind of gal um so i really i really enjoyed this book tremendously and in fact yeah i'm going to buy gifts and and give it to several people so you kind of talk about you know these personal things but you also share with us a lot of your core business beliefs and one of them was don't dally around be decisive can you talk about that this is something to me that is absolutely key. 
And if you're running a company, I've seen some of the worst things, even in the corporations that we work with. And as you mentioned, Carrie, we, we work with mainly Fortune 100, 200 companies now. And you might say, how did this little company in Austin end up working with all these big companies? Because we compete against everybody. I mean, we've got the big holding company advertising agencies that are after us. <laughs> and now Accenture, Deloitte, IBM have all these consultancies and have bought a lot of digital agencies. But an interesting thing happened to us in 1992. And this is the, I write about it in the book. It's the upside and the downside of my career. The best thing ever happened, the worst thing that ever happened. And that is in 92, we started doing some work for Dell. Dell was the, really, if you think about it, the only company based in Austin that had a national slash international footprint. There were other companies here. IBM had an outpost, Motorola, 3M, AMD. We could work for all of them, but we were not working for corporate headquarters because they didn't bring those people to Austin. They were just outposts, so to speak. And so getting to work with Dell, which was the Wild West, I will tell you, I mean, we'd say get 80% right and to hell with the other 20%. Let's just keep moving. But what was interesting is in 90, end of 93, I was in a meeting with Michael Dell and some of the marketing team at Dell and just me from the outside. And he said, all right, this next year, we're gonna start selling on the internet because it perfectly fits our direct model. And if you all know the history of Dell, the reason they cut the cost and the reason that they became successful is that they sold direct to consumer and direct to small business, direct to business, direct to big business. And so that was their strategy. What better to do that than to sell on the internet? So what happened is that my little company all of a sudden had a paying client who was working with us together to learn this internet thing. So here we were in the 90s doing all the stuff that no one else had even dreamed of doing. And we created this stuff and figured it out. We were the first people to put cookies on stuff and you know did the first big email campaigns. I'll never forget, we had an email campaign uh, with one of our Dell clients and we were terrified because if you do too many emails, people would opt out and we'd lose them forever. And so the first one we sent out, we knew the sales data because we had back-end uh, analysis with it. And they called us and we called them. We said, oh my God, we made a million dollars off this email. Let's do it again. No, 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 we're not gonna do it again because we have to wait, you know. We're... But anyway, all these things we learned. And because of that, we became a different kind of company here in Austin. And I will be forever grateful to Michael Dell, really, for um, being visionary and taking chances and doing that stuff. You'll read the book, though, if you read it, that we had a after 16 years, kind of an unfortunate parting with Dell, basically because they wanted me to sell my company, and I said, I'm not gonna do it. So anyway, that, that's part of the story. But we, we, at that moment, when we parted with Dell, we were billing $70 million of Dell business to us. It almost killed me to lose it. Uh, it really almost did. And I laugh and say that if you all remember me back then, I had dark hair, and uh, <laughs> I went white-haired in about three weeks and turned it blonde. So anyway, uh, but you know, it was it was wild. But we, but the good thing is, see, we had all this knowledge and we had all this stuff about how to do things on the internet. So other companies like Corporate Marriott, we were the Chase Corporate's first digital agency, and UPS. And so we learned how to do this through Dell and then parlayed it into other companies. So that's a big part of our success and you know how it all went down. Yeah, I had no idea that you were such a pioneer in the digital marketing. I mean, you learned it right along with Dell. You wrote that and you, that's what I mean about you learned as you, you absorbed that knowledge and then put it to use. In, in your book, it's really clear that you do that over and over. And I really, you know, you always say, you said always default towards action, cut your losses fast, prior prioritize action over perfection. Kind of that 80 per 20 rule that you were talking about. Yeah, and you asked me that earlier and I didn't completely mm -hmm. answer it, that um, a lot of the times I see when companies have a problem is when they just, they are not decisive enough. Mm -hmm. And you'll, what, what's the toughest thing in the advertising business is if you lose business, if the economy goes down, something happens, it's really hard to let go of your people. Uh, but 
I have run this company for almost 30 years, and I will tell you, we've never borrowed a dime to run the company. We've made every payroll, um, and we have made a profit every year. And so it's been 100% bootstrap, but it's not been easy because sometimes you have to make the tough calls. And that's the toughest thing you have to do in any business. When I have to lay off people, I was talking to some people earlier here tonight. I mean, it's the most gut-wrenching thing you have to do. Uh, but I look at it as we've got to save the ship. And so that happens sometimes. But our goal is to always continue to do well so that we can keep our great people and do that. But sometimes, like the 2008-2009 economy, we all were there. I mean, it was awful. And uh, I, I remember coming back from Christmas holidays, and in January of 2009, every phone call I got, I almost got sick to my stomach if they said the call's for you, because I knew what was going to happen. It would be one of our clients saying, you're not fired, but we just laid off 10 people, and I'm going to have to cut your budget by 40% or whatever. And somehow we held hands and got through that. But those things are going to happen. They're going to happen again. Um, so it's just how you face that and how you deal with that. And be quick. Because if you don't, the ship goes down. Yeah. Okay, one of my so other... That's a sad story. Yeah, that is, that is a sad <laughs> story. And it happened to you a couple... It's happened to you when you, had, you lost your Dell business. You had to make some well, calls. Well, actually, I see some people around mm -hmm. the room who remember 1988, 89, mm -hmm. 87. Here in Austin, it was ugly. And when I started the company, it was in one of the worst declines we'd ever seen. And Texas was really hit. So I've, I've been through that, you know, through that, the Dell loss, which happened consequently during the 2008, 2009 demise. So those two de decades were really rough. Okay, here's one of my other favorite core business beliefs. She has a whole chapter on this, or at least a section. Shoot the asshole as soon as you see one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I talk about this because <laughs> um, one time I was doing, a, there was a national conference that happened to be out, out near Bastrop at the Lost Pines thing. And I was doing this speech and so at the end, they said, well, how do you keep your culture alive? You know, what do you do to keep T3 competitive and have a great culture? And I just looked right out there, and I said, we shoot the assholes. And they all went, yay, went crazy. And so I decided, so the rest of the conference, I was going, you know, like this. But the thing, it's true. Um, sometimes, the big, and I'll just say this, the biggest mistakes I have ever made in running T3 in my company is when, I would interview somebody for probably a pretty senior position. They had all the credentials, they talked the game, they had the experience, they had the knowledge. Everything looked so good, but there was something in my gut, and I talk about trusting your gut a lot in the book, something told me they weren't right, but I didn't listen to my gut, and I would go ahead and hire them. Here they come into the company, and within a few months, like everyone is just can't stand them. And they really become just an asshole. And so, you know, I say sometimes my people that are assholes are saints somewhere else, but you have to release them. Let them go and let them be saints somewhere else. And so the toughest conversations I've ever had is when I would hire somebody and then realize that they were not right for the organization culturally, their demeanor, all the things, they just weren't right. And so I had to let them go. And it's ugly. It is always ugly when it happens. But you have to do that. And I was visiting with someone earlier tonight, and I said a crazy thing happened a few weeks ago. I was at a conference, and I ran into one of my good friends who has a company in Houston. She said, Gay, I had your book. It was just sitting around the house, and my husband picked it up on a Sunday morning and read it cover to cover. Mm -hmm. And then he went to the office the next day and she fired seven people. <laughs> And I went, oh, really, Margarita? And she, I said, oh, no. He said, Gay was right. You have to shoot the assholes. And he said, he said, you know, I just let those people hang around for months, and they were on probation, and they were really bad, and I just did it. I let them go. And I thought, well, that's good, but I'm sorry seven people lost their jobs. But, but sometimes that's what it takes is you have to kind of go enough, you know, enough, and you got to make those decisions. And it's like I said, it's always kind of good for the – the whole, the mothership, if you will, uh, when you get the right people in and out. I mean, it's very important to the culture. 
Well, let's talk about culture. Because did you realize that's what you were doing when you started T3, that you were building a culture? Or did that come to you kind of organically? I mean, and then talk about the T3s and under program. Yeah. Um, well, when I started the company, I knew one thing, and that is that I would be able to call the shots on the decisions we made, be them good or bad. And I made some good calls and I made some bad calls and I kept learning from that. But I knew that, you know, if we could continue to be profitable, that I could make some calls about stuff and make my own decisions and I wasn't working for somebody else. The only people we work for is our clients and we do work for them. And they, that's who we work for. So you, everybody works for somebody, you know, it's just the way it, it is. Um, so an interesting thing happened, uh, we were talking about the Dell business and in um, the time that we were really ramping up the Dell business, we were only at 36 people. And I had four women who got pregnant very close to each other. They were all on the Dell business. And I laughed later and I said, did I miss the ice storm that year or what happened? I, I don't know, but there were four of them who got pregnant very close at the same time. And I thought, what in the world are we going to do? Because I can't lose them and a couple of them I knew wouldn't come back to work. And, and we were in kind of a bind because we were really, you know, I had this tiger by the tail with Dell. And so I decided that what if we tried this crazy thing? I said, why don't you just bring the babies up here? Do your maternity leave and then bring them up here. No, it's not daycare. We're not going to have an on-site daycare. And my attorney found out about this uh, before it all happened. And he called me. He said, your CFO called me and said that you're trying to do this baby thing. And he said, don't do it. He said, you know, you're not a licensed daycare and you can't do this. And I said, Doug, you just watch me. Because I said, this is the right thing to do. We're like a family farm up here. And they're going to bring them up here and we're going to help take care of them. And you wouldn't believe this. but. It started and year by year we kept improving it and changing it and doing all the stuff and now 27 almost 28 years later we've had over 100 babies come through this program and it's a part of our culture it's a part of who we are and I believe it's probably the single biggest gating factor for women staying in work because it's so hard to take off and have a baby and then leave them when they're a little tiny. Um, so we kind of got the policy together and I, we've helped country, uh, companies all over the country try to put something in place. Very few do, because I think they know if they let the cat out of the bag, it's really hard to take it back. But we've been on ABC Nightline, the Today Show twice, all or every newspaper you can imagine in the country. And uh, it's something I firmly believe in and I know it works. The interesting thing that I've never quantified, but we see it every day, is that the little children who come to work every day with their parents, and it's men too, a lot of dads bring their children in, um, and, and adoptive parents, it's not just the, the birth mom. Uh, so we watch these little kids and they're in meetings with us. You know, and they're sitting there, little chair. We had one dad who was like feeding this kid while he was on the phone with Microsoft, you know. And um, what we've seen though with these little children is that they leave our program, they go on, and they're very, very successful in their own little ways. They're, they either are very good students or they're very social or they do these things and they have done really well. And the, the coolest thing of all uh, is that a couple years ago, uh, the new intern class came in for the summer. And we have a very interesting intern class. It's very competitive, sometimes over 2,000 applicants for 22 positions or 20 positions. In fact, Camilla, raise your hand back there, and Ruth, both of you were interns at T3 before getting your full-time positions. Yeah, um, and they're wonderful, but that's, it's a competitive program. So I walked into the intern class a couple years ago, and I don't pick the interns. I mean, that's something that's delegated these days. And the two kids in that room were two of my first two T3 and under babies. They were actually the first two. And there they were, Davis and Haley, and I cried because there they were and they'd made it through our program and they made it to the, to the final cut. And so that's been really rewarding to me. But our kids do well. And I honestly believe that they're listening to people having conversations. They're saying, Mom and Dad 
work in a good place. People like this. And, and we pass them around and, and they're socialized and all that. And I just think it's a really good practice. But it's been very hard to convince very many companies to do this because, again, I think it's a little risky to put in a policy and, you know, how do we handle this, how do we deal with it. But it's been a win-win for us. So how long can the people bring their babies? Well, it used to be almost nine months when we started it, but then once they started crawling or moving, the parents and we decided it was a bit dangerous for them. And so we've now got it at six months, And but that's a really nice segue. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time they're six months, it's not, you know, scary so much to leave them at three months or two months with the daycare or nanny. You've done other things. You let people bring their dogs. Oh, yeah, we have dogs. You know, and that became, that, that happened after the babies because one of my employees came to me and said, you're letting, you're letting these kids come up here. My dog is like my child, and I want my dog up here. And I said, okay. So we had to go through all that, too, because we used to have a lot of code browns and a code yellows, so like the dogs were peeing and pooing in the house. We said, no, 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 you can't do that. So now the dogs have rules, and if they can behave and they're good canine citizens, they're absolutely well welcome and I was in my office today and there were like six dogs running around and but they were fine and people liked that you know we're in a very high pressure business we have a lot of deadlines we have a lot of stuff to do and for five seconds if you can pat a dog on the head it just kind of takes the pressure off so yeah we welcome our dogs too no cats yet but because the dogs are like <laughs> so dogs by the dog. <laughs> you know when you You've pioneered a bunch of things. Did you realize you were a pioneer when you were doing it or only when you sat down to write this book and reflected back? You know, writing the book was an interesting, it was a reflection. And um, this may sound sophomoric, but I really wrote the book. And if you know what happens in business books, many of them have ghost writers or heavy editors that help them write the books. But um, I had a woman who helped me write the proposal, who got me to an agent in New York, and we got her involved. And then she was prepared to write the book. And I thought about it, and I looked at some of the stuff she was saying, and I said, no, this isn't going to work. I have to write this myself because I'm the only one who knows these stories, and I'm the only one who can tell my story. So fortunately, I do know how to write. I've, I've been writing for Forbes for a while. Uh, as a contributor and so I've been in the practice of writing so I just took off and wrote it but here's the ugly little secret of the book you can tell somebody but don't tell many people this um, uh, I wrote the whole book on a mini iPad with a zag keyboard and emails to my husband and to Ruth and to people at T3 and I would just send them emails and say this is part of this chapter this is it and so my husband Lee who's always been the person who organizes me said this is ridiculous. You can't write this book on emails. He said, we're going to have to put this in editing software or your publisher is never going to be able to deal with this. So God bless Lee. Um, I was sending the emails and he organized it into editing software, into the chapters so that we could really deal with the book. And, uh, but that's how I did it. But I did write it myself. So when, if, if you hear the audio book, I read it. And if you, um, uh, read the actual book. It's my words because it's me. I wrote it. And do you do it in emails because you'd be on a plane or something or you just little chunks? Yeah, because they're just very digestible chunks to read and it was very fun to read. Um, I tried to make it fun because yeah. I think most business books are so boring. By the page 40 you want to go, yeah, I've had little, it, you know. Yeah. yeah, I was so happy when I, it didn't take long to figure out that this was going to be a fun book to read. Um, you, you have other interests as well. I know you're a painter. Tell us a little bit about that work. Um, this has been a, the biggest surprise and reward of my recent years in life. And um, I was an art, like I told you, I was an art major in college. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts and Studio Art. So I trained to be a fine artist. Um, and one of the things that happened though at UT is that we had a class that was, oddly enough, in the art department at the time that trained us to draw and be like illustrators or art directors in advertising agencies. And after I graduated, they moved that program over to the communication school. But I just happened to be in a window of time where I did that. So I parlayed my drawing skills into being able to 
uh, draw comps and things. That's what we, how we did it back then. There was no Apple computers. There was nothing. So we drew everything that we showed clients, and that's how I got my first job in the what ad business. What do you business. mean by comps? Comps is what you would. It's, it's how you would draw what the ad would look like, or what the radio spot was going to sound like, and with with visuals of what a TV spot looked like. You had to draw every frame, everything. And so I was. I could draw really well, and I'm. I could do watercolors and do this stuff. So my things I showed clients were beautiful. That's how I got my job. But I always wanted to be an artist. And I had this, this dream back in the back of my head that someday I would show my work in a gallery someplace. And I never knew how that was going to come out. So <laughs> it was a long story, and I won't go into all of it, but it is in the book. Um, it's, it's kind of a circuitous thing. I ended up, though, starting to paint again. And end of 2014, just on a whim. I thought, well, you know, I'll just grab some canvas and brushes and paints and just see what happens. And so I painted a lot. Painted a lot of realistic stuff, a lot of very abstract stuff. And my husband, who again, is always involved with what I'm up to, said, well, you know what, Gay, I'm really glad that you're painting. It's good for you. This is therapeutic. It's really good. You need to do this, but don't worry about it because you're never going to make a thin dime on this but don't worry about it just do what you're going to do so long there's a long story that's in the book but i ended up unbelievably in 2016 with a one woman show at a gallery in chelsea in new york <laughs> yeah and unbelievable we broke the gallery records i saw 22 paintings in that thing so when i was sitting there i stayed in new york during the show a lot to talk to buyers and talk to people about my work and um, I got my first check and it was like $17,448.57. I remember exactly. And I called Lee and I said, Lee, let me read you the amount of the check that I got um, <laughs> for my first uh, part of the sales from the show. And I read it to him and I said, if my math is right, that's more than a thin dime. Do you agree? And so he said, congratulations. I guess you're an artist now. And so um, that led to two more shows in New York, a show in Houston. And I just did one in Austin. But um, Austin's not an art buying town. And so it's, it was tough. But we've sold a good many. I've sold 15 all around. But um, the other, some of the other cities are more. And I find it kind of interesting that this is such a creative city. And we have film and music and all that stuff. But people don't come here to buy art. And so I'm building my own gallery. <laughs> Not here, but it's going to be at our ranch. And I would like to make that a creative center for artists. And where it's a little difficult to get there. But uh, I'd like for Austin, the Austin area, to be a little bit known more for a place that you can buy art um, and I can help some of the galleries here too but uh, it's, it was a, an interesting experience to, to, to watch kind of how Austin has not really gone that way and Houston's an art town you know people go to galleries to buy art I was just in Houston last week on an art field trip with Umoff and yeah then, yeah wow. it's a lot of art um, all right so it's 7 15 7 20 ish um, why don't we open it up to the floor? I love to you all. Yes, yeah, if y'all have questions, we'll pass the mic. Okay, Amy, got a question? Yeah, I don't think I need a mic. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to the Me Too generation or Ooh. folks who are dealing with um, mm -hmm. systematic sexism mm -hmm. and can't, you know, they're trying to giddy up and they're not getting ahead? What would you say? Oh, well, you know, I've, I've dealt with so many of the things that people talk about. You can imagine my career. I mean, you know, I'm 62, and, and, and there was a lot of sexist issues and stuff like that. Um, I think it's good to expose these things and have a conversation about it and a discourse. But I go back to my principles in the book. You can't wait for all these people to come out and feel sorry for you and do something. And so I'm asking women um, to really kind of take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and goes back to my competency level thing. If you are really good at something, and I'll give you a specific example. There's a woman in my company who was never told to learn about artificial intelligence. That wasn't her job description. That wasn't what she was told to do, and her manager or no one said, go do this. She took it on herself. 
she was a self-starter and learned so much about it that she's now in client meetings with these huge clients we have and she's the expert on AI at our company. That's the kind of behavior that I'm trying to instill in people. And then the Me Too thing becomes, well, yeah, I may have been, you know, overlooked or I may have had a sexual situation that wasn't comfortable, but guess what? I'm really good at this and I don't care what you do because I can stand up and make my own path based on things I'm interested in, based on my own competencies and you can't take that away from me no matter what you do and so I've really been out there you know talking to a lot of these young women saying you're going to find all kinds of stuff that doesn't seem fair out there but don't worry about that you you get what you want out of it and don't back down so it's tough I mean we're in a tough time right now with all that stuff because no one in my generation would have said a word we couldn't have I mean I would have ratted on my boss about stuff I mean, this wasn't even possible. So the fact that people couldn't even say anything, you know, is interesting right now to me. I don't know if that answered your question, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, let's go to Vicki, and then we'll come to you. First off, excellent answer. Thank you. Yes, get on with it. And the second question, yeah, really. And the second question is, my, my question is, um, you've, you've been successful at so many things by getting up and getting on with it. What are, you, what are you doing now? What do you want your legacy to be? What means the most to you and what's your next chapter? Well, I couldn't have done any of the things successfully that I've done without the right people in my life. Uh, my mother was a big part of that. My husband's been a big part of that. The people at T3 who surrounded me uh, that I say short uh, my weaknesses and I really want to teach people that we can't be good at everything and and the only like if I had told you you know that I would just become a great tennis player at this point in my life that wasn't going to happen I mean I was never good at tennis and so I've learned how to get these things away from me that I'm not going to be good at and so I knew I was a good artist. I mean, I already was trained to do that. So it wasn't like I just decided to go paint someday. And, you know, Texas Monthly named me one of the top 10 artists to collect right now. And that was a big deal to me. But it was something that was a core value and a core belief of something I'd already done the work to do. And I, I didn't just walk out to the so ranch one day. You're saying develop the competency. That you already have. Yeah. The things you've worked on. And if you haven't worked on it yet, go in there and work on it. Um, I'm working on a podcast right now. It's a lot of hard work. It's much harder than I thought because I like to just get, ah, blah, blah, talk. But there's a lot of details and a lot of stuff that's going to have to go around this to make it successful. And uh, But that's what people have asked me. They've said, what are you going to do after the book? And while well, I might do another book, but... This is something I think I can do that a lot of people would listen to and would like to know kind of uh, how I'm talking to people. So, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting that I've chosen things that I already knew how to do, really. So it's not, you know, writing a book I'd been writing. You know, to tell you the truth, do you all know about UIL sports and stuff in Texas? Okay. I was a UIL ready writing champion back in high school. I went to state. I've always known how to write. So going back to writing, I wrote copy for advertising business. I wrote articles. I've written all that stuff. So writing a book, doing art, and being a passionate person who wants to forward my industry and to continue to embrace technology and all this, those are things that, those, those aren't new. And so I didn't just, you know, I'm not sure I would do if it was a net new endeavor. I'd have to work really hard. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, Gay, would, would you have a comment on, uh, my understanding there's 110 women been elected to Congress, mm -hmm. which is the most ever. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that's a tipping point for more women to get into politics. So do you have a comment on that and the trend that you see? Well, uh, as you heard earlier, um, the first woman to be the chairman of the Texas Business Leadership Council, and for everyone's kind of history on that, that was the Governor's Business Council that was started under Ann Richards, and it stayed the Governor's Business Council until Rick Perry ran for president the first time, 
and we had some agendas that he went, his team wasn't real fond of, and that was that we were exposing some of the deficit, uh, def, uh, problems, let's say, with the Texas school system. And so I've been very active behind the scenes in politics with things that I think are important for our state. I think it's very important for women to run. Um, people are looking for different voices. I think it's time for some changes. Uh, so I'm very encouraging of people who want to be involved and do that. Um, we'll see. It's, it's a, Washington is a very tough place to survive. So I don't know, it, it may really hurt some people in the short term, but I think in the long term it's going to be very valuable. Uh, and women do things differently. I mean, I've watched women run businesses differently, but um, I don't feel like I am counter to any of that. Um, I feel like I try to run a good business. I'm a business person first, but the th decisions I make and the things I do are different. And uh, I'll tell you, this T3 and under thing, I had a lot of men along the way who wanted to kill the program at T3. Not tenable, we can't do it, we can't do it. It's just too difficult to manage, and I stuck to that. Um, so maybe some of these women who'll come in can kind of look at things a little differently and challenge some things, and I just hope we get a debate going again. I mean, the most horrible thing to me right now is that it's just nobody wants to talk to anybody. You know, it's just I'm on this and I'm over here, and we're not, we need to get some conversations going, and I, I hope We'll see that maybe some of these women coming in will at least reach around and say, can we talk? You know, let's put our egos over here. Can we just talk about the situation? Uh, we'll see. Well, that's one of the things you've been very good about is you, you talk about this in your book that you would get all these different, you know, participants and pe everybody in their own silos and you would break down the silos and begin dialogue even within companies to root out like problems and solutions and that's one of your gifts uh, to me from reading it one of your strengths that you you know how to do that and you value that I do um, that to me that's been it is a gift of mine and I, I do like bringing people together and trying to get people to solve problems on a bigger level but as you most of you probably know um, since we work with these big companies and especially in the past there were big silos in these companies it was based on business units it was based on there was a digital team there was an analytics team there was a traditional advertising but we're seeing all that coming together under one strategy and I will tell you something that is so amazing. It was probably uh, over 15 years ago. We were maybe 20 now, time flies. Um, but we were sitting in a meeting internally at T3 and a person got up and put this circle in the middle of a chart and wrote internet on it. And everything else revolved around that. Print, television, radio, outdoor, all these other mediums we we're familiar with. And we said, it's, we realized everything's going to hub at the internet. And that's where all this stuff's going to live and come out from. And so that's been the thing that, you know, was our vision really for the longest time. Of course, now we have a bigger vision, but um, that's what drove us, that we believed that if we could really be good at that digital space, that that's where everything was going to come into. And we've watched budgets and we've watched everything come that way for so long that that's how we survived through thick and thin and all these things because all the media money and all the television money and all the stuff kept going back to where people could measure stuff. And that was one thing I learned from Dell too. Their big mantra was if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And we learned that in the 90s, and so that became everything we did. And honestly, um, it was perfect for me because my business plan when I started T3 was that I wanted to do excellent creative, and I wanted to be able to measure it. And a lot of people weren't measuring work, and a lot of people weren't doing great work. And so I'll tell you one quick little funny story, and then we probably have to let people go do their thing. But. Um, I was at dinner with Lee. Remember John Pierce? He used to, do you remember John Pierce? It was over on 35th. Well, so that was one of our places we would hang out years ago. 
And we went in there because they had a great bar. So he took me to dinner there one night right after I'd started the company. And he said, all right, Gay, what are you going to do to differentiate this little company of yours? You're three people in Austin, Texas during a recession. <laughs> what are you going to do? And, you know, of course, failure was not an option because we, we were broke at the time. I mean, it was a terrible time. And so I went into these big platitudes of, that was in my business plan. It was like, we're going to do award-winning work. It's going to be awesome. And we're going to hire great creative people. And then we're going to try to measure this and measure that. And, and you just said, who's going to remember that? So we ordered another glass of wine, sat down. And I said, well, it's going to be the science and the art of the business. Make it simple. So we will do excellent, beautiful work, and then we're going to measure it. He said, now who's going to understand that? Finally, after the third glass of wine, I said, damn it, Lee, we're going to do kick-ass work for clients who want to kick ass. He said, that's it. He walked up to the bar, got a napkin, and wrote it down, and that is still hanging in the foyer of T3 today. And that's been our mantra all these years. And it was more profound than I would have ever believed at the time because yeah, we wanted to do kick-ass work, but when I said for clients who want to kick ass, mm -hmm. that's to find the company that we wanted to keep all these years. We are not happy with clients who are just with the status quo, sitting in a corporation, just biding time. We want clients who are pushing the edge and they're looking for the next new and how to make a difference. And so it, it, it's been kind of how we judge what companies we work with. And because we're independent, we can do that. We're not forced to work with anybody. Um, so that's been my thing. And so I always laugh and say, I didn't just put kick ass on the front yep. of my book. Yeah. I've been saying that for since a long time. <laughs> now, that's, that's the thing, thing I didn't realize either. I mean, I hadn't seen the napkin in T3, so I didn't know. <laughs> all right, we need to wrap it up. So if you all have books that you would like to, to be signed, Gay, we wanted to sign them up here. I think it works better. You're at the right. same level. Or you want to go we can go, go back there to the table. Yeah, we'll I have, the table. Um, and I, one last plug. I mean, we've done really well with the book. Um, Amazon, I've got 103 positive five-star reviews, and I have five people who weren't thrilled with it, but that makes it real, right? Um, and so um, I do think it makes good gifts. Uh, we're kind of almost at the point of another printing it's they've sold we've sold about 10,000 books which is pretty good uh, in the era of you know mm -hmm. tough times for authors and that sort of thing so um, I hope that if you have any gifts or you want to do that we, we brought books tonight I'm glad to sign them to anybody you know and, and I appreciate your attention tonight it's so fun to be home in Austin to do this I've been all over the country and actually all around the world talking about it and uh, I appreciate you all coming out tonight on a cold night and spending time with us tonight. So I'm glad to sign. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. much.